Hi, welcome to How to Repair. In today's video, we're going to be discussing thermostatic problems with cookers and ovens. On this cooker, we have a standard type thermostat, which is connected to a capillary tube that goes through to a probe in the top right hand side of the oven. This is filled with gas and controls the temperature via the gas expanding and opening the contacts on the points. If you have a more modern cooker with a circuit board, this is normally controlled with a sensor. And this is an electronic sensor that reads the temperature in ohms reading. And then the computer board actually translates that ohm reading to a temperature. In this video, we're not only going to be showing you how to change the thermostat, and this is a Beko cooker uh, who manufacture for all these makes you can see on the screen here. So this video is appropriate to any of these makes. Now, the thermostat we're going to be replacing is part number 26348002. The thermostat is easy to change, but the cooker needs to come out of situ. But before we do that, we need to understand if you may have a problem with the thermostat or a possible other problem with the cooker. The cooker itself has many different elements inside it. This has a dual grill element, a base element, and also a fan oven element. And the selector switch uses these in multiple different combinations to the desired cooking function that you require. If any of these elements become faulty or open circuit, it would give the illusion that the thermostat was not cooking correctly. The reason it would do this, because if we turn it to the convection oven setting, which uses one circuit on the grill element with the base element, what is actually happening is you've got two elements to cook the food, and the heat is generated on both sides, and the fan motor distributes the heat if you have the fan motor engaged. On this setting, we don't. It is just basically the two elements. If the element at the bottom had gone open circuit, your food would be getting cooked, but only cooking well at the top. It wouldn't be cooking well on the underside, and it would have trouble reaching the right temperature if you were cooking at a high temperature. So you need to make sure that this little light here, which you can see, and if I zoom in for you here, this thermostat light here is actually on the timer. And if we turn the temperature down, it goes out. Turn it up, it comes on. This is indicating that power is going through to the elements after the selector switch has been selected. If this light is staying on and not going off at all, then you may have a problem with the thermostat. If it is going off at a low temperature of around 100 degrees, but you are still not getting the cooking done correctly, then you may have a problem with an element. Now, there are many videos in this series on Beko cookers to show you how to check and replace every element on the cooker. The other problem you may have is with the selector switch, as a lot of people are not using these selector switches correctly in conjunction with the actual oven. If I can explain, you should never ever Turn the thermostat on first and then start changing the selector switch. The reason being, these contacts are designed to carry the load in ampage, but they're not designed to be flicked round with load on them. The thermostat is actually designed to cycle, meaning the points will open and shut as the required temperature is reached. So you should never ever use a thermostat before turning the selector switch to the appropriate function. I hope I explained that correctly, and that is a very worthwhile tip, as manufacturers are not printing this correctly in their manuals, in my opinion. Okay, before we take the cooker out of situ, in other words, removing it from the cupboard, I want to show you the actual probe and the capillary tube. And if I just put my torch inside so you can see, and we zoom in here, at the top right-hand side is the actual probe, and it's mounted on a plate. It is very important that that probe is always in the original position that the manufacturer put it in. If it has dropped down, it would be reading the temperature from a different location in the oven and therefore giving the thermostat a false reading. Now, the next thing we need to do is remove the cooker from the actual cabinet. Now, this is time stamped, so if you know how to do this, you can jump forward in the video to the next appropriate point. If you have a freestanding appliance, it's easy to work on. But when you have a double oven like this one or a single oven like this one, we're going to need to take it out the housing first to actually work on the appliance. OK, the first thing that needs to be done, you need to isolate the electricity at the fuse board because the plug for this appliance may be behind it or in an adjacent cupboard. You may have it hardwired as well, and this needs to be dealt with before we lift the cooker out of situ. 
when accessing the fuse board, you may have a single oven or a double oven. This is a 16 amp supply. This is a 32 amp supply, or you have the main switch. Turning these off, but if in doubt, you can always turn the main power to the property. Now that you've disconnected the electricity, it is safe for you to actually start removing the oven. Now, what we need to do here now is remove the actual door, not only for the purpose of lightening the load on the appliance, but also to make sure that no damage occurs to the glass when we actually take the oven out of situ. To remove the oven door is quite simple. Just open it up. On the early models of Beko machine, there will be some catches on either side that you need to bend over to actually take the whole hinge out of the frame. But on the more modern cookers, there are a couple of catches that we need to press down. And just pressing these catches down on each side, and I'll put an exploded view of this in the side here, you will then be able to actually release the two pins on the door. Take the door up to its natural position, and then you will be able to slide it away. Now we're able to remove the interior of the oven. Now we're ready to take the cooker out, but on double ovens you will need a table and I suggest putting a towel on top of it and you may need two people to actually lift the cooker to get it out. With a single oven, I just use a small crate. Putting this down, we are then able to remove the two screws that hold the actual cooker to the chassis of the cabinet. On double ovens, there may be up to six screws. Now that you've removed all the screws, we're ready to lift the cooker out. Putting your hand inside the oven, carefully lift the oven over and slide it out, dropping it down onto the case. Now, if you are using a larger oven, you will need to actually have some help doing this. We're now able to turn this around to the side, making sure that you're not pulling the cable too hard. Then we'll be ready to disconnect the appliance from the electricity. If your oven is plugged in, you'll now be able to remove the plug. But if it is hardwired in, we have to undo the electrical connection. You may even have an isolation socket behind the cooker. To remove, just put a small screwdriver in. And there's two clips on this that you need to put your screwdriver in just to lift up. But to double check everything, do go across the live and the neutral connection to check that there is no electricity present. As there is no electricity present, it's safe to undo. Undoing the retaining clip, move that away. Now we can undo the live, the neutral, and the earth. The cable can now be pulled out and put safe. Okay, now you've got the cooker out of situ and you've learned how to take the door off because it does make it much easier for working on the appliance. We need to actually remove this top panel, which is two screws on either side. And then at the rear of the appliance, we've got three screws on the top and multiple down the side. It will vary from model to model. The top panel will come away but be careful of the edges, they are sharp. On some of the Beko cookers, the panel will hinge away, giving you access to the appliance. Okay, now we've got the cooker here to work on and you can see all the components. I'm just quickly going to run through everything with you so you understand the basic functionality. Base element, fan oven element, grill element, cut out thermostat for safety, fan motor, light fitting, cooling fan. Now we come on to the actual thermostat and the other components. The thermostat is connected via a capillary tube that runs through to the probe that I showed you earlier in the oven. You'll notice that this is cylindrical. There are no actual right angles on the pipe. This is because this pipe is filled with gas. As the oven gets hot, the gas expands and therefore adjusts the thermostatic range on the actual thermostat, meaning that if you set it to 100 degrees, it requires the gas to expand a little bit more than, say, at 50 degrees. Therefore, more heat is needed in the oven before the contacts open. 
This then is connected to the actual selector switch. Now, when I do a test later, a live test, we'll be actually using the base element and part of the grill element. This means that the contacts on the actual selector switch, and if I bring this up for the camera here, would have, say, two contacts down. One of the contacts would be going through to the two, uh, circuit on the grill element. The other contact would be going down to the actual uh, base element, sorry. And the thermostat is what would control the actual temperature, turning these two elements off together as it goes to the right temperature. A circuit board uses a slightly different approach. It uses an electronic sensor with um, an NTC sensor or PTC sensor, which controls the temperature via an ohms reading, which is then sent to the circuit board, and the circuit board interprets, interprets that uh, ohms reading into centigrade and then decides when to turn the relays on and off. The actual timer also has a relay on it. And if I zoom in for you here so I can show you, the actual relay here is naturally in the open position when you first power up the cooker, meaning when it's on automatic. That means that no power will be able to go through to any of the components on the cooker until the relay is closed in other words, on the manual function. Timers can go faulty and relay, relays can go faulty and they're easy to change. All you have to do is solder them and get the correct values of the relay, but that's in another video. Coming back out now, uh, the basic checks that we would do are one, with the thermostat, there are two wires. You have a feed in and a feed out. Now, to basically test the temperature of the probe at room temperature, all you need to do is put your multimeter on, and I'm going to put some uh, clips on here so you can actually see and I don't get my hands in the way. Put one onto the feed in. One onto the feed out. Turning the meter on, and it's on uh, continuity. Turning the thermostat on, you will see now it's got continuity, meaning that power would be going through to the appropriate function on the oven. And as it got to temperature, the thermostat would click out, turning the power off, therefore reducing the heat in the oven. But that is at room temperature. The thermostat might not be working because it's lost the gas in the tube or the probe has got damaged and lost the gas and therefore not able to operate at a higher range of temperature. I hope I explained that correctly for you. One of the tests that you need to do, and a matter of fact, I'll leave one of my probes on there, is a live test. Now, the live test is basically finding out if you've got power going through to the thermostat. Now, to do this, we can do exactly the same, but changing the meter to the 240 volt range, because I'm in the UK, uh, I would need to actually plug the cooker in for this, and I'm also going to connect the neutral wire to the feed from the actual supply. So that's all set up, and now I can plug the cooker in. Again, I do emphasize you should only be doing this if you are familiar with electrics. Now, I've initially just plugged the cooker in. Now, if I go here now, there is no voltage. This is because the timer relay is not energized. I need to set it to manual to be allowing power to come from the selector switch to the thermostat. So if I just go around the front, as you saw, the light comes on, on the correct setting. If I check power here again now, you can see that we have 240 volts. If I go through to the other contact with the thermostat off, there is no voltage. Turning the thermostat on, we now have voltage. This means that this wire now would be supplied wire, a uh, supplied electricity, which would actually go through to the appropriate element. The only thing you can't check is the temperature range. It would be possible to disconnect the actual probe and put it into hot water to see if it will come on at a different temperature range for you. Uh, but basically, that is the way that you test to see if the thermostat is either sending power to the actual um, elements 
And the other test, of course, is to see if the thermostat is cutting off. Now, if you want to make sure and you're cooking at, say, 100 degrees, that thermostat should become open circuit at 100 degrees. So all you need to do is make sure with an electrical test that there is no power or the power is being cut off from the thermostat to the elements at the appropriate temperature. Now, the next thing we'll do is show you how to change the thermostat. OK, to change the thermostat is quite straightforward. Carefully pull back the insulation. And if I zoom in for you here, you can actually see a screw that holds the mounting plate inside the cooker. Just undo that screw. Remove it. Then carefully, you will need to slide this out carefully. And here is the thermostat probe. And this is connected under the grill, as you could see earlier. Now we need to turn the cooker around. And I'll place that on the top. Now we need to turn the cooker around. Carefully pulling the knob off. And you'll notice inside the knob there is a piece of steel. And it needs to make sure it stays in there because a lot of times this piece of plastic here can break when these thermostats get old. There are two screws behind here that we need to undo. Uh, on older cookers, you may have to remove the actual facial panel, which means removing the whole top. Uh, this will vary from cooker to cooker in the way that you do this. Once you've undone the two screws, and they can because they're indented, they can be a little tricky to get at. We're then able to grab the thermostat, taking off the two wires and the earth wire, detaching the probe, and here you have the thermostat. And as I said, you'll notice that there is no actual major kinks in any of the tubing. This is because this is filled with gas. To fit the new one, just follow the way that we actually installed the old one, making sure to get it round the correct way. Drop the screws back in. Making sure that you get the half D correctly located with the actual plastic. Turning the cooker back around. Now, sometimes thermostats do not actually come on the mounting plate, so you will need to carefully mount your thermostat on the actual mounting plate. Then thread the thermostat in. And make sure you're very careful about doing this, as you don't want to damage the probe. And make sure you try to keep the insulation intact. Reconnect the earth and the two wires. And there we go. I hope this video helped you fix your cooker or oven. Remember, if you have any further questions, I will need your brand, your model number, and a detailed description of the fault or you could upload a video to YouTube and send us the link. You can either use the comments below or the contact us page at the website, and the link is in the description below. And if you do need any parts for your cooker or oven, remember some parts are serial number dependent, so make sure you have all the relevant information before ordering the parts. Thank you very much indeed for watching this video. If we really helped you, you can always click on the Bipolar Beer page to support the website, as that's what keeps us going and able to make these videos for you. Thank you very much indeed for watching.